Hi, it's Carl Allen. Welcome to lesson two of module seven financing. So today we're talking about seller financing. What is it? How does it work? How we can use it? And also earnouts, which is seller financing, but it's contingent. It's bonus related. So they're not guaranteed payments. And then also I'll walk you through bullet repayments and how you can use those in your deals as well. Now, seller financing is using the seller's own money to finance the deal or a portion of the deal. So you're effectively paying for the business over time, but you're using the business's future profits converted into future cash flows to make those payments. It's like a lease to buy model. And remember the deal making triad that we talked about before. If you've got a highly motivated seller, you can do 100% seller financing deals in some cases. I've done them, lots and lots of other students have done them. Now, the other thing with seller financing is depending on the negotiation, it can be interest bearing. So you might be asked to pay 5% or even 10% interest on that money as well. So let me give you a quick example. Let's say you're doing a deal and it's got $1 million of revenues, $100,000 of profits. So it's a 10% profit margin. And you're buying that business at a two and a half times multiple. So your enterprise value, remember from the, uh, the valuation lessons, is now $250,000. Now assume that there's no adjustments for surplus cash, liabilities, real estate or anything like that. So $250,000, that's what you're paying for 100% of the shares in the target business. And let's say you're doing a straight seller financing deal over five years. So there's no closing payment here, just a five year seller financing note. So you'd be paying $50,000 a year times five. So even if you didn't grow that business, if that business continued to crank out $100,000 a year in profits, then you're getting $50,000 a year and the seller is getting the other $50,000 a year. However, you need to factor in the debt service. That's repaying any external financing that you've secured for a closing payment. In this example, we don't have one. Now, the other thing to think about with seller financing is the seller is typically going to want some security over that money. And there are six types of security. So I'm going to walk you through them all. And as we step up from one through six, they give more certainty to the seller. So they're more seller friendly. Some of these I would actually never do. And I'll explain as we go through the list. Now, the best form of security for you, my friends, as the buyer is actually not to give any security. And I've done some seller financing deals without giving any security because the seller was so motivated to get out of the business, I was able to negotiate that. But it's very, very rare that you can get away with no security whatsoever on seller financing. Now, the most common option on a straight 100% seller financing deal with no external financing, whatever, means no debt, no equity, no SBA, nothing like that, is to give the seller a full security debenture over the business. It's sometimes called a charge or a lien on all the assets in the business, it's like a big safety net. That means that if you don't make due on those seller financing payments, the seller in the future could come in and take the business from you by seizing the assets. However, if you're raising external financing for a closing payment and you're using those assets in the business, let's say you're financing the real estate, the inventory, the receivables, the, the fixed assets or, or whatever it is, then the financier will be using those assets to secure the loan. So you can't use those same assets to secure the seller financing because they're already being used to secure that asset based loan that you've used for any closing payment. But if you have that external financing, what you can do is something called a clawback. Now you're giving the seller the right to claw back or take back on the remaining shares in the business that you have not yet paid for. So let's do an example. Go back to our example deal. The total consideration 
including the debt that we were inheriting, was just under $2.1 million. And we negotiated $830,000 in change of seller financing, which is about 40% of the total deal value. So if you did this deal and you never paid the seller financing, the seller would legally have the right to come and claw back, to take back, to repossess that 40% of the shares in the business because you've paid for the first 60% with your closing payment. So this is to give the seller security that they can get the outstanding shares back that you haven't yet paid for. But as you make good on that seller financing payments every month, every quarter, every year, then that clawback, it ratchets down. So every time you make a payment and you eat into that seller financing balance, it gets smaller and smaller. That clawback amount decreases because you've paid for more shares. You've acquired more of the equity. So this is where I typically stop. I never go beyond this, but I've seen people give even more security it's because the fourth option would be to offer a clawback on 100% of the share. So it's all or nothing. So bear in mind your merger model, you've got all of your deal synergies and all of your cross selling cash flows. You might be extremely confident that this combined group is going to absolutely generate so much cash flow that you're happy to have a 100% clawback if this is the only way you can get the deal over the line with a big chunk of seller financing. But the danger here is that if you've made 95% of the seller financing payments and for whatever reason, you couldn't make that last 5%, the seller legally has the right to take the entire business back from you, which is why I absolutely don't do it. And I don't advocate that you do it either. Now, the next option is even worse, but we'll talk about it anyway, where you agree to only receive the shares as you pay for them. So in this case, in our example, we'd only have been given 60% of the equity in the business at closing because the seller would have kept the other 40% and would only release those shares to you as you make those seller financing payments. That's kind of okay. But the challenge is, under a normal membership or operating agreement in that business, you're going to have a partner shareholder who will technically be entitled to 40% of any cash flow distributions that the business makes. If you're going to offer this level of security, you'd have to have it written in the sale and purchase agreement. And we go into this more in module number eight. You have to write it into that agreement that that you get 100% of the distributions from the business, even though you only own 60% of the equity, because you're going to need all of that cash flow to actually service the deal, pay the seller financing, and service any debt that you've got from buying the business with the closing payment. And finally, there's number six. And I've seen some people do it. Personally, I think it's crazy. I've never done it. Just move on to the next deal if you have to do this. But what you can do as a last resort is you can sign a personal guarantee with the seller on the seller financing. But again, I strongly advise you not to do that. Okay, now let's talk about earnouts. Now, earnouts are slightly different to seller financing. They're bonus payments, so they're not guaranteed. They're like seller financing payments. They use the future cash flows of the business, but the bonus payments, those cash flows need to be over and above what the business is currently generating. So this is where you've got big future forecasts in this business and the seller wants some kind of value for that in the future. Remember, we can only value the deals on what they're currently doing and have done historically. We can't place a value on big promises for the future. But if everyone's confident that those promises are going to be realized, then the seller should agree to an earnout to receive some of that future value. Now, earnouts are often used to bridge a valuation gap between you and the seller. So let's say you've offered $4 million for the business. Uh, but the seller wants five. What's another million dollars? You could offer that one million dollars extra through earnouts. And what I love about earnouts is you shift more of the deal risk from you to the seller. 
So you're making some of the payments contingent on some pretty strong performance, which I'll show you in a minute how to calculate. And earnouts will work really well if the sellers especially bought in to your growth strategy. They really liked you. You've built that phenomenal rapport and relationship and you've really nailed that foundation layer of negotiation. And they really like you and they, they see that you're going to be able to really scale the business and make it even more profitable in the future. And you can offer a lot more to buy the business, but then structure it so that you have a much smaller closing payment and then a massive earn out. Again, it's great for you because it's all contingent on growth. It's all contingent free cash flow. And earnouts, if you want to, can also be capped. So you can fix them at a certain amount or you can leave them uncapped as a certain percentage of increased revenues or on increased profits. And I'll show you how to do both in a minute. And if you absolutely knock performance out of the park, then the seller can potentially make a lot more money from selling you the business. It's generally the case, though, that you link an earnout to a solid financial metric, something that you can measure and something that can be independently audited. So it's generally revenues or it's EBITDA. Now, I've done plenty of deals where earnouts were linked to revenue and profits combined, but it's so horribly complicated. You generally do one or the other, and I'll talk you through the differences in a minute. Now, sometimes you can tie some of the earnout to something that's not financial, like if the seller were to find you a new GM, and that could unlock, say, a $50,000 earnout or something like that. Or it can be a big new customer that's been signed up, but they've not started generating revenues yet. That could be another little piece of earnout bonus as well. Or if there was a load of, of IP cooking in the oven, waiting to be developed, and then that got fully commercialized in the future and rolled out to the market, that could generate another piece of earnout as well. But generally, earnouts are related to either revenue or EBITDA. So let's go back to the example of the deal that we were looking at earlier. And if you remember, as part of the offer sequence I walked you through, we could sweeten this deal by offering $400,000 in earnouts. And just to remind you of the numbers, in the enterprise value simple model, we have the current year plus the two previous years. And that model structured the entire deal. So let's look at doing a $400,000 EBITDA earnout. So the floor that we're going to use for this calculation is the company's current EBITDA number, which was just under $700,000. Now, let's assume that this business has got a four-year forecast. So you look at the business, and it's going to grow by about 10% per year going forward, from 2.9 million to 3.3 to 3.6 to 4, and to $4.5 million in revenues. And let's say the margin improves a little bit next year from 23.8% to 25%. And that margin is sustained going forward. So it's a nice, healthy business. So that gives us an EBITDA of $825,000 in year one, $900,000 in year two, a million dollars in year three, $1.13 million in year four. So the difference is the gap between the EBITDA in the forecast year and the current floor, the number that we're currently looking at now, which is $700,000. So the difference in year one, $127,000 in year two, almost $202,000, year three, three hundred two, and year four, four two seven. So the total difference in EBITDA across those four years is just over $1.05 million if, of course, the business hits the numbers. So our earnout, remember, was $400,000. So let's say you put $100,000 of the earnout into each year. You can actually step it up if you want to, and you can flex it around, but it's simpler just to put it in a hundred grand a year. So what you're actually doing in the first year is you're gonna generate an extra $127,000 of EBITDA, but you've got to pay the seller $100,000. So almost 79% of that additional cash. But as the business scales, that rate comes down. Across the four years, you're actually only paying out 37.8% of the total 
incremental profit to the seller as part of that earnout structure. So you're keeping, you're keeping the other 62.2%, which is obviously very, very good. Now, one of the pushbacks you might get is the seller doesn't want to do the earnout on EBITDA because clearly, while sellers have had some hand in these growth trajectories, when they leave, they have no longer got any control on what your expenses are. So I've been in so many bun fights on deals where rules and conditions were put in place on for an earn out on what expenses could or couldn't be justified. And, and often it's just easier to take the earn out back to revenue because it's cleaner. You as a business owner can manipulate profit numbers, as you well know, but you can't manipulate revenue. So if you're doing an earn out as a revenue split, again, it's still $400,000. It's going to be $100,000 a year. The revenue floor is the current year. So just under 3 million. And then we've got the forecast we had before going from just under three all the way up to $4.5 million. But this time, instead of calculating the EBITDA difference, we're calculating the difference in revenue. So there's the difference in year one up to just under 1.6 million in year four. And we're generating the earn out now on a percentage of that revenue, but it's a much smaller share as you can imagine, because revenues are larger than profits. Now, the seller's share of the incremental revenue is going to be just under 28% in the first year, right down to just over 6% in the fourth year. So you're sharing on average 11% of the incremental revenue over and above that floor, that $2.9 million floor over that four-year period. Now let's talk about bullet repayments. So bullet repayments are cash lump sums you could pay off at any time. It's still seller financing. There's still guaranteed payments and you've got the same security and, and the default positions that you had before. Now, these will typically be written into the sale and purchase agreement and you can link them to a certain measure of liquidity. So you can require that there needs to be a sufficient amount of surplus cash available to make that bullet repayment or some other type of liquidity test like the quick ratio or the current ratio or the working capital ratio or anything like that that we talked about before. And again, it's really, really hard to get these agreed, but you can try and negotiate it if you so wish. Now, there are two types of bullet repayments that I've used in the past. One is the 90 day deferred closing payment, which allows you to split your closing payment into two parts. You make the bigger payment the day you close the deal and you take ownership, and then you make a 90-day post-closing payment to come up with that balance. And this allows you to do some working capital re-engineering inside of the business once you've bought it. And you can also go and sell equity or raise additional financing through crowdfunding. I'm going to show you how to do that in the next lesson, lesson number three. So let's go through an example. Let's say it's a 90-day second closing payment on a $2.4 million deal. You're going to pay $1 million at closing. Then you can have a $1.1 million seller financing note, or it could be an earn out, or it could be a mix of both. Let's say over three years. So now you've got a $300,000 gap. So let's say you agree you're going to pay that extra $300,000 as a bullet repayment at 90 days. And you're going to do that by managing the working capital inside of the business. Let's say there's $150,000 that you can get by selling some obsolete fixed assets that are no longer required for you to trade the business. But they're just stuck there and you haven't used them for any kind of financing and that, you know, they're not part of any debentures or liens or charges. So you can actually pick them up, go sell them, generate some cash. Then let's say that you generated another $75,000 in cash flow from shortening your receivables and extending your payables. So your cash conversion cycle in your business, as you know, then starts to accelerate and it starts to generate more cash in the bank account of the business. Then let's say you start to manage your inventory better. Remember the ratios that we went through in the financial model. The more times that you turn over or your churn the inventory in the business, the more cash that you can generate. Again, you could be doing some of that. Let's say all of that generates that $300,000 of additional cash within that 90-day period, and that's the cash you use 
to make that second day closing payment. The other thing that you can do with bullet repayments is to pay them at the end of the term. So again, same example, $2.4 million deal, $1 million at closing. You've got the $1.1 million sellers financing note for 36 months, but you can't do any working capital re-engineering. So you're still $300,000 short. Just make that a $300,000 bullet as a final repayment in month 37. So you're paying the seller financing for the whole 36 months, and then there's a bullet payment in month number 37. That gives you three years and one month to build up all that extra cash to then make the final payment. So that's it for seller financing, earnouts, and bullet repayments. I will see you next in lesson number three on equity financing. Until then, bye for now.